Where do games and models meet? And what's so special about this space? Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Skinner, a freelance researcher and science communicator under the name Flood Skinner. This is a home recording of the presentation that I gave to the Play for the Planet conference at the University of York in April 2024. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about that space where models and games meet and why it could be so useful to us for advancing environmental research and action. Now by the place where games and models meet, I do not mean on the tabletop in a game of Warhammer, although I could talk to you about my armies for hours and hours. By games I'm talking about computer games, and specifically simulation games, so games that have representations of natural and human systems to enhance the gameplay. And by computer models, I'm talking about the models that we use to understand those systems or to extrapolate into the future to aid our decision or policy making. Adapting to environmental and climate changes around us is utterly reliant on those models. So it's really important that people understand what they can and can't do, what their limitations are, what is their appropriate use. And this is something called model literacy. And this is something where games can really help us. The crux of my argument today is that if we think of both games and models as the same thing, even though they have obvious differences, or at least as having a common ancestry, there are benefits that can be found. For example, if we start with the equation for projectile motion, you can build a model that helps put the space shuttle into space. Or you can make a game where you lob furious avians at ramshackle porcine forts. Similarly, you could make a game out of the rocket launch model, and you could also use the principle of Angry Birds to create a tool to target artillery within a war zone. This is a useful moment now to think about how we use models. I like to think of models as translators. They help us convert data that we do have into the data that we need to help us make decisions. And there's usually a gap between those two things. So to borrow an example from my day job, Say we need to know how much damage a future flood might do so we can plan for it. The information that I have is about how heavy the rain might be in the future, what the surface of the land looks like, and the locations of the properties people live and work in. Now I can translate this through a series of models, what we call a model chain, to give me an idea of, that, of the damages the flood might do. A hydrology model will translate the rain into river flows. A hydraulic model will then take those river flows and translate it into a flood spread, or what we call an inundation. And an economic model will use that flood spread and the property data to calculate the damages likely to be caused. I say translate because it is similar to translating languages. We could use a tool like Google Translate to do this for us, but we all know that that isn't perfect. It can miss the nuances and the tones and the meaning in that language. So even though it can give us a good idea, it isn't perfect, but it becomes even more useful when someone with expertise in that area helps us with that interpretation. For models, the mathematician George Box summarised this perfectly with the modelling mantra, all models are wrong, but some are useful. As modellers, our goal is not to make less wrong models, it's to make more useful models. And here is a list of some of the things that makes a model useful. And if you look at that list, many of the things are contradictory to actually making that model less wrong. For example, we might need to take away a lot of the detail in a model to make it run faster, or to fail less often, or to cost us less to run. Now if we are thinking of games and models as the same thing, we can use this concept of usefulness to help us understand the differences between them and why they exist. And so I'm sure you're aware games have a very different purpose to models. So what actually makes them useful is also different. And here is a list of some of the things that I think makes a game useful. Now there's another quote here which I think perfectly sums this up and it's from Frank Lance who is the director of the New York Games Center. And this is from his Hearts and Minds talk at the Games Developer Conference a few years ago. And he said, games combine everything that's hard about composing an opera with everything that's hard about building a bridge. Games are basically operas made out of bridges. And what he's saying is that games are a combination of the arts, storytelling, artwork, music, 
and engineering, that building bridges. Models, though, are the same thing, but they don't really have any of those opera elements. They are really just bridges made out of bridges. So is it possible to bring the two things closer together? Now many years ago I worked on a game based application called Humber in a Box. It started out life as a model that I built to help understand future flooding around the Humber estuary. So here it is predicting flooding from the 2013 storm surge, but in 100 years time when we're expecting sea levels to be 1 meter higher than they are today. It is relatively detailed. And this animation takes about 26 hours to process on a powerful PC. As a modeler looking 100 years into the future, 26 hours isn't really a long time to wait for this data, so it's quite useful to me as a model. However, if I was using it as a game, players want to see their decisions realised in real time. They don't want to wait 26 hours to see the consequences of their actions. Therefore, it's utterly useless as a game. So to make it useful as a game, I had to start gamifying the model. And the first thing I did was started adapting my bridges, the engineering elements of the model. I didn't need all that detail that I have on the model because no one's going to be making decisions based on this game. So I reduced the resolution of the data that I'm using by an order of magnitude. I also reduced the area by not representing the rivers as realistically. But now it ran a lot quicker and I added a slider to the model so users could change the sea level themselves and the model responded dynamically. I then worked with games development students who had skills that I don't have to add in some of the opera elements. And the same basic model was rebuilt into the Unity 3D gaming engine. They gave it 3D graphics and visualized it in virtual reality. And by placing the model within this museum room, it began to have some elements of storytelling in there. Now I wouldn't go as far as to say this was a game, but it had game-like elements and the usefulness of that original model had been changed to make it more useful as a game. So why do I think this is so important? First, it could help people understand models and how we use them and what they cannot or cannot tell us. It can help us build that model literacy, which is really important if we want to advance environmental action. And I hope this presentation too has helped you understand a few things about models a little bit better. Secondly, Humber in a Box allowed people to get hands-on with the data and science. They did their own experiments and this helped them understand the complex issue of sea level rise better. So by doing that own experiment, it allowed them to persuade themselves of the message that we wanted to get across. And self-persuasion really is the most powerful form of persuasion. And finally, in a similar way to how physicists have used science fiction in the past to help them explore concepts that are currently not um, experimentable, games could provide us modelers a platform to test new approaches. So for example, a game like City Skylines really represents almost a, a digital twin of a city simulating both the natural and human systems that exist within that city. From a point of view of making real world decisions, the science behind those modelling approaches used in the game are decades away from being reliable enough to be used in the real world like that. But the way the game puts them together really could be a framework of future ways we might approach decision making, and by gamifying that approach gives us a way to explore it even though we're not ready to use it yet. So thank you for listening to this presentation. If you've enjoyed it, please do click the like button and subscribe to the channel. Your support is massively appreciated. It encourages me to make more videos and to keep doing this. But for now, stay dry out there.